Okay, I think we are ready. Today we have uh, Yogesh Yogelogica, and he will talk about conserved quantities and their consequences in PT symmetric systems. So off you go, Yogesh. Okay. Uh, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this seminar, and I want to thank uh, Andreas and uh, uh, Frank for putting together uh, this really nice series uh, in lieu of sort of what would have been a regular week-long conference. Uh, but this one is really, I think, a alternative way where we are able to pace ourselves, you know, spend some time thinking about what we heard uh, in the two weeks in between. So I think uh, there's some significant merit to this sort of uh, a conference series as well, where you are not overloaded with, uh, with, with new ideas. And so today I want to tell you about uh, uh, some of the work we have been doing on PT symmetric systems. Uh, I should say I came to this field about maybe eight years ago uh, when I attended a PT conference, uh, my first in Dresden. And I remember being so confused and so excited about this uh, very interesting topic at that time. Uh, so uh, today I want to tell you about some of the work that we have done in uh, uh, conjunction with my experimental colleagues. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I am from this uh, hybrid university in Indianapolis, uh, which is uh, from joint campus of Indiana and Purdue uh, called IUPUI. And uh, this work was uh, done with uh, my uh, graduate student, uh, Frank Onanga, who is now a postdoc at uh, Air Force Research Lab in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and also with uh, Frank Isek, who is a Miloslav student who was kind enough to visit us for, I think, about two weeks. And it was through the discussions uh, uh, that we had uh, during one of my visits to Prague and uh, Frank Isek's visit that uh, this sort of topic uh, emerged. And then uh, there is Xu Peng's uh, group in Beijing, uh, who was our experimental collaborator in observing some of these things. Uh, all right, so let me get started. Uh, All right, so here's the summary or uh, an outline of my talk. Uh, I know many of you are sort of steeped in the area of PT and I would like to give you my overview of it. And it's more of a historical interaction of how I learned about PT. Uh, and then I'll talk about constants of motion in non-Hermitian case and what are sort of the interesting results that come about when you consider uh, the conservation laws which are associated with open systems. Uh, then I'll show you some experimental results and in particular focus on what are the consequences of having uh, sort of these sort of conservation laws and with an outlook I will start. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, I apologize to the experts uh, in the audience sort of, you know, who all know about this, but I'll tell you about my view of this field, uh, which is uh, introduction to PT uh, theory. Uh, I was a postdoc, I think, in Los Alamos about 20 years ago, or maybe about 18, 19 years ago, and I saw this paper called Complex Extension of Quantum Mechanics. And I tried to read it, could not make much sense out of it, but uh, was very excited about it because it talked about this set of continuum models, uh, which had a completely real spectrum. Yeah. And so the basic idea is that you have continuum models, which is a non-relativistic uh, Schrodinger equation for a single particle uh, with a Hamiltonian given by a kinetic term, which is our usual uh, momentum square term, and a potential term, which for uh, not sure what good reasons, one's decided to investigate complex potentials, basically. Okay. Uh, so you have a non-Hermitian PT uh, symmetric kinetic energy term, and a potential term, which is x squared times i x to the power epsilon. So for example, when epsilon equals zero, uh, this gives you your well-known uh, simple harmonic uh, oscillator. Uh, but when epsilon equals one, uh, this gives you a purely imaginary potential called i x cubed. And uh, when the spectra of uh, such a Schrodinger equation is calculated, energy versus epsilon, uh, then what you find is for positive epsilon, uh, uh, the eigenvalues are purely real. Uh, and these are numerically calculated eigenvalues. For example, here, when epsilon is zero, you see these equally spaced eigenvalues, which are all odd integers in the units that we are using, two n plus one. Uh, and then as you increase epsilon, then you keep seeing that uh, the level spacing becomes non-uniform, 
uh, but you still have uh, essentially purely real spectrum. And so this sort of is a generic feature where uh, you have purely real spectra for small non-hermeticity and you get complex eigenvalues for large non-hermeticity. And in this case, uh, the large non-hermeticity, quote unquote, is sort of really indicated by having epsilon, which is negative, uh, where if you are at arbitrarily small epsilon, which is negative, uh, you would have a certain set of purely real eigenvalues, but beyond that, you would get uh, eigenvalues which become complex conjugate pairs. And uh, so this was uh, this sort of transition where you go from purely real spectrum to complex conjugate spectrum uh, is called PT symmetry breaking transition uh, because when the spectrum is purely real, uh, then you have the eigenstates uh, of your Hamiltonian. They can be chosen to be simultaneous eigenstates of the antilinear PT operator. But once you have sort of complex eigenvalues, then the eigenstates, because of the antilinearity, uh, uh, no longer remain eigenstates of this complex eigenvalue, basically. Uh, so, all right, uh, this was uh, back in 90, or started around 98, uh, and then after that, there were significant uh, work that has happened over the last two decades in this topic. Uh, if you do not understand differential equations easily, and I do not, for example, reproduction of this spectrum is something I have never done yet, uh, then it turns out that many of these key features, though, are also found by, or are supported by even the simplest of matrix examples, uh, which is what I work on, which is sort of finite dimensional models. And so, for example, if I take a Hamiltonian, which is this two by two matrix, which is a you can think about it as a particle in a magnetic field, H equals minus J sigma X, and a purely imaginary Z field, basically. Uh, then this two by two matrix, of course, tells you that the eigenvalues are given by plus minus uh, square root of J squared minus uh, gamma squared by four in here. Uh, so you will have real eigenvalues when non-hermeticity gamma is small. Uh, you will get complex conjugate uh, eigenvalues when non-hermeticity gamma is large. Okay. And at gamma equals, uh, I guess, 2j, in this case, uh, the eigenvalues become degenerate, and that is what is called exceptional point. Because in this case, and this is a generic feature of uh, PT systems, uh, you also get a set of uh, eigenvectors which are parallel to each other, basically. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you found some set of, I mean, you know, you, you have some set of complex uh, Hamiltonians which have purely real spectra. What do you do with it? And so, uh, the, uh, the initial process, uh, as I understand it, on this front was uh, to pursue option watch, which is to develop a consistent quantum theory. Yeah. Uh, so you have eigenvalues which are uh, purely real, but the eigenvectors are not orthogonal to each other. That's the consequence of non-hermeticity. Uh, but as you know, uh, orthogonality is defined with respect to some sort of inner product. When I said they were not orthogonal, I meant according to Dirac inner product or the standard inner product that we use. Uh, however, uh, you could imagine redefining an inner product, uh, finding one uh, which traditionally has been called the CPT inner product, such that uh, it is an inner product, meaning it is positive definite, uh, and it is basically makes L, uh, the Hamiltonian self adjoint uh, in the region where the eigenvalues are purely real. If the eigenvalues are complex, there is nothing you can do because you cannot make them real. If the eigenvalues are real, you can fix the orthogonality problem, basically, by just sort of, you know, redefining how you measure angles, roughly speaking. Uh, so if you now consider uh, and make this edge self-adjoint, uh, then you will get a unitary evolution because now you have a, a Hamiltonian and a new quantum theory, which is defined with respect to a new inner product, basically. And it will be a fundamental theory. So this is what is a complex extension of quantum mechanics, so to speak. And once you have that, then that means you can study a host of new problems, basically, which are problems from standard quantum mechanics, but now ported uh, to the PT symmetric region uh, of these complex Hamiltonians, basically non-Hermitian Hamiltonians or Hamiltonians which are not Hermitian with respect to Dirac inner product, uh, but will turn out to be Hermitian with respect to some new inner product, and therefore they were called sort of pseudo-Hermitian, for example, or quasi-Hermitian. There are various terms, as far as I know, in the, in the literature. So you could study problems such as uh, what's the shortest time it takes to go from one state to the other. Uh, you could, because you have a unitary evolution, you could define thermodynamics. Uh, you could study statistical systems. Uh, 
uh, such as Jarzinski inequality and things like that. And all of these sort of studies uh, have been done. Uh, of course, if you are developing a consistent new quantum theory, uh, then there is some cost to be paid as well. Uh, because what we are doing is now developing a new theory where uh, the observables and the born rule, for example, is modified to use the CPT in a product instead of the Dirac in a product. And so that means that this is a procedure uh, which is valid only in the PT symmetric region uh, because that's where you can carry out this procedure when you have real spectrum. Uh, and one particular consequence of it is that the observables in the theory do depend on H. And here by observables, I mean operators which are self-adjoint with respect to uh, the same sort of you know, self-adjointness definition that you're making H self-adjoint with respect to, which is sort of the CPT in a product, for example. Okay. And therefore, uh, you would find that uh, the usual quantities such as uh, position, momentum, or spin operator uh, may no longer be observables uh, in the sense that uh, uh, they will not be self-adjoint uh, with respect to this new inner product in general. Yeah. Uh, so that was sort of the, the, the first development thrust uh, after the discovery of these uh, non-Hermitian uh, PT symmetric Hamiltonians uh, by, in fact, uh, you know, uh, some of the people who are present in this seminar right now. Uh, and so the, the next question was, uh, what is the second option? If, if I can either develop a consistent quantum theory, which applies to the uh, PT symmetric region, uh, or I can try to do something else. And what was done, uh, which was a, in my view, a parallel development basically, uh, was uh, something by Christo Dulaitz, and that is to think about PT symmetric Hamiltonians as a model for open systems. Yeah. So one of the sort of long-standing questions, I think, uh, in the development since 98 to maybe even 2000 days or 2005, 2006 was basically, uh, okay, I have all these very interesting and mathematically consistent results, but what does a potential like IX cube mean? And how do I realize it in a lab, basically? What does that sort of stand for? Uh, and I think this was a key insight which came from uh, Rushaft and uh, Christo Dulaid's uh, group. And that was to realize that uh, Schrodinger equation uh, basically is identical uh, to paraxial approximation for Maxwell equation. So if I have sort of light propagating in an array of waveguides, uh, uh, then for the unholic function of this light profile or the light uh, packet, uh, the Maxwell equation, when you sort of make this paraxial approximation, basically is isomorphic to what would be Schrodinger equation. And in this case, uh, the role of the potential for the particle uh, is actually just played by uh, the index contrast or the local index of refraction. And this is a quantity which we very well know uh, does have an imaginary part, basically. Uh, in the, uh, for example, in the derivation of index of refraction that we sort of calculate uh, in, or we study about in Jackson, uh, we get that at finite frequencies, you will have an imaginary part which represents the loss of light or the absorption, which is commonplace and is sort of indicated by a negative uh, imaginary part uh, to the index of refraction. Uh, on the other hand, you can create positive imaginary parts which basically represent gain of light or amplification. Uh, although in that case, one does have to be careful about the fact that it cannot be constant. It usually saturates uh, as the intensity of light increases in a, in, in a local area where the amplification is taking place. So the PT symmetric potentials really represented systems with balanced, spatially separated gain and loss. And in the case of uh, light, uh, the PT symmetric potential basically satisfied uh, this criterion, which I write here, which is to say that if I have sort of some amount of gain on one side, then at its mirror symmetric side, I must have equal amount of loss, basically. N star of minus x should be equal to N of x. And that criterion basically gave you realization of PT symmetric potentials. And I think this sort of opened the floodgates of experiments, really. So I've shown here some of the key papers which over time have uh, sort of you know, discovered PT in a variety of uh, settings. And that is because this idea is so general, basically. Uh, when you think about gain and loss systems or systems which are with balanced gain and loss, then uh, it really, you have the freedom to think about gain and loss of what. 
in the case of the uh, uh, optics over light, which was, this was one of the early theory papers. This was one of the experimental papers where you had only passive PT, which is to say one lossy medium and non-lossy medium. This was a paper with uh, gain and loss. But you know, in the case of light, uh, the gain and loss really corresponds to that of uh, the number of photons or equivalently the energy. Uh, but the energy loss is also present in LC circuits. And so you had these sort of circuits where you, know, you had an LC circuit with a resistance in it. Uh, that's your lossy area, uh, for example. And then you connect it inductively uh, to a LC circuit, which has an op amp, which effectively acts as a negative resistance, basically. And you could still talk about what happens to that system, or uh, you could have this uh, mechanical version of it, uh, basically, where you have one pendulum uh, which has undergoing a loss, and then you connect it to another pendulum which has a gain, uh, which is going on. And the generic features of it is that when I have a large amount of gain and loss, uh, then whatever amplification happens in one part of the system uh, is not efficiently balanced by uh, the decay that happens in the other part because the communication between the term, them, which is driven by the Hermitian part of the Hamiltonian, is weak. On the other hand, if the communication between these two, uh, the gain side and the loss side is strong, uh, then whatever gain happens quickly gets shuttled to the loss side, compensates, and roughly speaking, this whole system behaves as if uh, there is no gain or no loss, or it's in some sort of quasi-static case, basically, or quasi-equilibrium case, rather. Yeah. Uh, so this was sort of the uh, option two, if you wish, which is that PT symmetric systems are models for open systems. And I should point out that all these kind of discussion that I've talked about is really classical balance gain and loss because I'm always thinking in terms of large amounts of energy, large numbers of number of quanta of energy. Uh, and that is why I can make a deterministic model for gain or loss without having to worry about the fact that uh, the loss would be having some fluctuations as well as the gain would be having some fluctuation. So uh, this really opened the floodgates of experiments. Uh, and that led to the next question, which is that if I have some effective models of parity time symmetry systems in classical systems, uh, can I do that in quantum systems? How do I do it? And what are the options for it? Okay. So in the, before I go there, I want to sort of you know, quickly go over what is the basic phenomenology of the systems. Uh, so the time uh, dependent state of the system evolving under a PT symmetric Hamiltonian would be just given by the Schrodinger evolution, where if this is time dependent, then this would be some time ordered product time evolution operator. Uh, that's sort of understood. Uh, but we'll find that because H is not equal to H dagger, uh, the norm of the state or the energy in the system, total energy in the system will not be conserved. So in the PT symmetric phase where the eigenvalues are real, uh, the norm oscillates basically. Uh, at the exceptional point where the two eigenvalues uh, become degenerate and the eigenvectors also become degenerate, uh, the norm has a power law growth, basically. And then uh, in the PT broken phase, uh, I will have that the norm has an exponential growth, although that statement should be taken with a grain of salt because uh, that's not going to be always true. Uh, once you start to have large light intensity, this sort of a notion of having a constant gain is not accurate, so uh, fine, we know how to modify it. And this is about the same problem that one gets in laser physics where uh, the laser model with a gain medium needs to be sort of uh, changed once uh, you are above threshold. And in fact, essentially what happens is that instead of exponential growth, you will get some saturation because of nonlinearities in the gain medium. All right, so this is the basic phenomenology. And what are the limitations of this classical model? Uh, at finite temperature, although we have a loss, we have ignored uh, the uh, fluctuations that are associated with that loss according to fluctuation dissipation theorem. And at more importantly, at zero temperature, although loss medium is okay, the gain medium would always have some quantum noise. And that noise and the consequences of that uh, will unbalance the gain and the loss. So that is another part which we have ignored, basically. And this sort of, this turns out to be a more serious problem, which is why, to date, there are no experimental realizations of PT symmetric systems which have true gain in a quantum level, basically. 
So one can ask, okay, you know, does this mean that this is basically a wave theory model or can I have some quantum effects in PT symmetric systems basically, or can I have sort of PT symmetric systems or these, some of these interesting properties in the quantum domain. Uh, and it turns out you can do that basically. And that is because these key properties that we talked about are really shared by even a non Hermitian model, which is shown here, instead of gain and loss, I just have a neutral and a lossy model. And this non-hermeticity, which is mode selective dissipation, uh, still gives rise to uh, the same sort of, you know, level attraction and then coalescence of the eigenstates and things like that. And this is something you can see over a number of recent papers where this has been realized in the single photon level in ultra cold atoms in uh, a superconducting qubit, uh, in each of which case, basically we have a no loss, loss realization of a PT symmetric system. All right, so this was sort of, I described to you these two approaches by which the field of parity time symmetry or non Hermitian systems has evolved uh, in, in, in my view. And just to sort of recap that, uh, these are the two models. And I remember initially uh, these two models or the fact that there are these two very different models is something that used to confuse me a whole lot until I learned a little bit about these different approaches. So uh, one approach is uh, fundamental theory. Basically, we are saying that PT symmetric models are fundamental models. Uh, that kind of where by fundamental, I mean you can define a self-consistent quantum theory by having or redefining your inner product, which makes your edge self-adjoint under some new inner product, basically. Uh, so its properties are that it's sensible only in the PT symmetric region, because that's where you can carry out this CPT inner product procedure. Uh, you can define a unitary time evolution according to this new inner product that you define, which is positive definite, basically. So you have everything self-consistent. Uh, once you have that, you can carry out a whole lot of uh, sort of you know problems in this uh, new domain: uh, thermodynamic, Jarzinski, decoherence, slowdown, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a question of okay, are there systems in nature which evolve according to CPT in a product? Uh, I am not aware of any. Although you can certainly simulate them because in the end it's a unitary evolution. And so if you have a quantum simulator, uh, which allows you to implement a certain unitary, uh, you can say that uh, that unitary evolution, which you can mimic, for example, has been done with an NMR. Uh, that is something that uh, is simulating a, a PT symmetric system uh, in the PT symmetric region, for example, yeah. uh, or where the eigenvalues are real. Uh, the other model is an effective theory. And the effective theory basically is applicable in all regions. In other words, it's a theory which works in real or complex eigenvalues. Uh, the evolution is not unitary, but you do not get so much bothered by it because uh, it's, an, well, it's an effective theory. You do not necessarily need unitarity and so on. You are not claiming the universe is not unitary. You are just saying this box of mine, which I'm looking at and which talks to the environment, uh, is what is not uh, sort of undergoing unitary evolution. Now, with this effective theory, when you do calculations using Dirac in a product, uh, you do get enhanced sensitivity, mode switching, unit direction propagation, a whole lot of properties which uh, appear in the wave systems, which is something that uh, people have used to make experimental models of uh, parity time symmetric systems or non Hermitian systems uh, in a wide variety of experimental platforms, basically. Uh, and so these two approaches. Uh, are sort of parallel, to some extent parallel approaches because one does not talk to the other. And one of the things that I wanted to think about or what we did in this work, it turns out, is that we tried to get the implications of this approach to that one or try to reconcile. It's not really reconciling the approach. It's really using some of the ideas from the fundamental theory approach uh, to find consequences of it that are observable in the effective model approach, basically. And so now I think I'll really start with my, uh, sort of, you know, the, the domain content of my talk, uh, which is, uh, let me think about PT systems as effective models. So I am uh, just going to think about them as open systems, classical or quantum, uh, does not matter. Uh, and what I, so they undergo a non-unitary evolution, uh, which I talked about earlier, and that's fine. And the question I want to ask is really, uh, okay, I understand it's an open system. It has gain and loss, or maybe it has just loss. Uh, are there things that remain the same? 
uh, as a function of time? Or are there constants in non-unitary PT evolution? And what are the consequences of it, basically? Okay. So uh, let me remind you some of the basic quantum mechanics, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, in the Hermitian Hamiltonian case, in the standard quantum theory that we learn about, uh, we define a constant of motion as an operator O, uh, which actually commutes with the Hamiltonian, but that equation can be written in the form that I have written here, OH equals H dagger O, basically. Because H equals H dagger, this is a trivial restatement of basically commutation, or in other words, A, H and O commute. And we know that expectation values of the commuting observable are constant. Uh, these are constants of motion, basically. Uh, in particular, uh, O equals identity works, and therefore the norm of a state is constant as a function of time, basically. Right? And then when you find other things which are constant, then it provides you insights into, uh, into, into your model. Uh, in particular, these observables, uh, not observables, but the constants of motion uh, were very crucial in developing self-consistent methods or self-consistent approximation methods for many body theories, it turns out. For example, conserving approximations or random phase approximation and various hierarchies of approximations that are used in condensed matter, uh, one of the constraints that they had to do was they should satisfy, even in the approximate form, the conservation laws that the underlying Hamiltonian was satisfying. And so in some sense, uh, the identification of these conservation laws paved the way for development of approximate methods in many body theories, basically, uh, which told you that, for example, uh, when you are uh, doing calculation for susceptibility, uh, then you must term, um, if you are sort of, you know, if you are summing certain terms, you must sum all heart rate terms or all bubbles or all ladders, which is sort of the exchange terms or it's the cross terms, uh, which are the ones which give rise to localization. And a variety of those things, uh, which were developments of consistent approximate methods, uh, was sort of, you know, preceded always by identifying what are the constants of motion in each case, basically. Now, in the non-Hermitian case, uh, a operator eta is called an intertwining operator uh, if eta h equals h dagger eta, basically. And this is something that has been well known in the PT community for, for a very long time. I mean, these are some of the early papers which discuss uh, uh, sort of, you know, various formulations of CPT in a product versus in terms of a intertwining operator or a matrix operator and things like that. And this is a simple math proof to show that if eta satisfies this, eta h equals h dagger eta, uh, then the expectation value of eta uh, would remain constant as a function of time. And because this is a linear equation, I can, without loss of generality, take eta to be Dirac Hermitian, which is what I will continue to do henceforth, basically. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, now the other point I want to sort of drive home is that this is a relation which is independent of the spectrum of H. In other words, uh, this is a relation which is valid uh, both in the PT symmetric region and PT broken regions, basically. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, we know that in the PT broken region, at least under this description, uh, the norm of H, uh, sorry, the norm of a state rather, uh, grows with time. Okay. And indeed, uh, we find in this equation that if I put eta equals identity, this equation is not satisfied. This just says that the norm of the state should not be constant. Okay. So really just identifying these etas give you what are the constants of motion in the uh, in the uh, in in uh, open systems, basically. Okay. Uh, so now the question is, what are these etas, and can we figure them out, basically? Okay. Uh, so there has been a lot of work in this field and a lot of understanding of it, basically. Uh, and what we contributed, I think, was uh, for finite dimensional cases, provided in this paper, sort of provided a recipe for identifying these uh, in a finite dimensional case. Okay. Uh, so. The eta is called a intertwining operator if it satisfies this relation, as I mentioned. And in particular, you can check very easily that for a broad class of H Hamiltonians, which are PT symmetric but non Hermitian, uh, parity itself is an intertwining operator, basically. Okay. So, in other words, uh, eta I1 equals P, which in the, I guess, literature has also been called PT in a product instead of CPT in a product, for example, uh, that also remains constant. Uh, it is a constant of motion, but it's not positive definite. 
And therefore, it's not a metric. It cannot be used to define self-consistent quantum theory and so on. But it doesn't matter. For me, it just says basically that expectation value of P remains a constant. Uh, and now I should point out that this one also tells you that these constants of motion are not local. Because when I think about calculating expectation value of P, uh, then basically what I'm saying is I take the wave function on some side, multiply it by the wave function conjugate on its mirror symmetric side and add up all of those values, basically, these non-local correlations. And when I sum over all of them, then that is a thing that remains constant. Basically. Yeah. Uh, this kind of conservation law is different than what we think about as conservation laws or conserved quantities in typical physics, where the quantities that are conserved are integrals or sums over some local quantity, basically. You know. So it could be, uh, and therefore you sort of think about the, from the conservation, well, from the conserved quantities, then you get local conservation laws, which are continuity equations of different types. In this case, uh, the quantity that is conserved is this non-local quantity, basically. Yeah. All right, so uh, P is conserved, okay. Uh, now you can show with a really very little or no math that if eta one is a, uh, is a intertwining operator, then eta two, which is defined this way, is also an intertwining operator, basically. And eta two and eta one do not commute with each other. So in some sense, they are different, basically. Okay. Uh, if you want to do this all sort of dimensionless, I could just do with, with uh, eta one h divided by the energy scale and so on. Uh, but then eta three, which is eta one times h squared is also an intertwining operator. And so I can create this whole sort of tower of intertwining operators basically, which are given by eta k equals, you know, eta one times h to the power k minus one or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so it gives me a whole lot of intertwining operators or a whole lot of constants of motion, each of which is a non-local expression basically. Yeah. Uh, of course, this tower has to collapse in a finite dimensional H because it satisfies a characteristic equation of its dimensionality. Uh, and therefore, higher order intertwining operators would be linear combinations of lower ordered ones. And so it turns out basically this process gives you D total linearly independent or non-commuting intertwining operators for a D-dimensional Hamiltonian. So for a two-dimensional Hamiltonian, I will have two intertwining operators, uh, which actually go by the this so-called eta one equals p and eta two would be what is called cpt in a product that would be the positive definite one uh, in the pt symmetric phase basically okay. right. uh, for three dimensions uh, this would give rise to three intertwining operators which were uh, three conserved quantities uh, which can be written in terms of some sort of stokes parameters and they were also discussed by crystal Lloyd's group a while ago basically when they were considering a pt symmetric trimer uh, what we have here is a general process of just having intertwining operators uh, for any finite dimensional uh, model, basically. Uh, all right, uh, so you have this. Uh, now the question is what would be its consequences and how would you observe this? Now to some extent, observation of conserved quantities in an experiment is a boring process. Because in the end, what you're expecting is something remains constant with time, you know. Uh, on the other hand, I think it has some merit because you are learning to implement this kind of a Hamiltonian in a non-permission platform, uh, or, you know, different platforms. And so that is what we decided to do uh, with Shupeng's group, basically. Yeah. Uh, so for the experiment, which was done with uh, Shupeng's group in Beijing, uh, we decided to explore sort of a PT symmetric four-dimensional uh, system, basically. Uh, and this is just a four-dimensional version of a, of a model with uh, Eva Murray uh, and uh, collaborators have explored a while ago, uh, and which has sort of shown up again and again and again, which is basically just higher dimensional representations of SUD. Yeah. Uh, so I will consider this model H, which is minus J SX, and then some I gamma plus delta SZ. Uh, and this is a transfer symmetric, I mean, this is a symmetric Hamiltonian, although it's not Hermitian. And when delta equals zero, this is a PT symmetric Hamiltonian, basically. Uh, in general, if uh, this is a spin S representation, then I will get a Hamiltonian, which is of dimensionality 2S plus one. So when S equals a half, then I get a dimer, this 2 by two model, which experimentally has been sort of experimented extensively, or a trimer, which has been done only by one group, uh, Mercedes uh, or Crystal group in an experiment. 
uh, for s equals three half, you will get this as a uh, q with d equals four or four degrees of freedom, basically. Yeah. Uh, so physically, what this really corresponds to having, let's say, four waveguides, if you wish, or four rings or uh, four resonators, two of which have gain, the other two have loss. This stuff varies linearly across it. And also couplings, which are not uniform, uh, basically, uh, nearest neighbor couplings, which are not uniform. Uh, and this is a Hamiltonian uh, that is, has a gain and loss, but it can be modeled onto a Hamiltonian, which has only loss by essentially taking out the largest gain part and putting it to zero, and then shifting each of those loss, passes, loss parts down accordingly, basically. And so uh, this is what uh, was done in the experiments. To implement this Hamiltonian or its time evolution, you need to implement uh, the non-unitary time evolution operator uh, that this H generates, basically. Uh, you can do that with a linear optical circuit because all, every unitary can be, sort of every single particle unitary can be implemented uh, by beam splitters and phase shifters in a, in a scheme called universal linear optics or KLM scheme or various names for it or REC scheme. Uh, but then along with beam splitters and phase shifters, you introduce more selective losses where basically you say that if my photon is going through path one, uh, then it has no loss. If my photon is going through path one but has a horizontal polarization, it has certain amount of loss. So now I have path and polarization as the two degrees of freedom. And those basically the upper horizontal, upper vertical, down horizontal and down vertical were sort of the four degrees of freedom that we were using uh, to implement this kind of a uh, PT symmetric system, basically a lossy system. Okay. Uh, so what do you do? You have these four degrees of freedom. You put in loss in the three of them, uh, which is more selective basically. Uh, and that allows you to faithfully mimic uh, the evolution under this Hamiltonian, basically. Okay. So for example, uh, if you undergo this process and then also rescale the data back, because remember, this is a dissipative system. So actually, everything is going to die with time. But uh, you can map this onto a PT symmetric system by adding a uh, imaginary identity part, basically, uh, into a gain loss system. And so all the calculations are carried out in the PT symmetric language, basically. Uh, if you want to just think about the dissipative language, then essentially when you get complex conjugate eigenvalues, essentially what you get is that certain decaying modes start to decay slowly as opposed to decaying fast as you increase the loss even more, basically. Okay. Uh, so after doing all of that process, uh, for example, here it shows that the state norm measured as a function of time uh, at the PT symmetric uh, or the exceptional point, which in this case is of order four, uh, this state norm goes as t to the power six. So all the sort of dots here are experimental data, the lines are the theory. And this basically shows that indeed we are mimicking a EP of order four because at exceptional point of order four, you expect the state norm to grow algebraically at long times as t to the power six, basically, or t to the power two times k minus one, where k is the order of the exceptional point. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, demonstration of it being an exceptional point of order four. Uh, Let's say you are sitting at the exceptional point here, delta is zero, gamma is equal to j, so all the four levels are degenerate. Now you introduce some detuning, you introduce sort of walk away from the exceptional point, but not along the PT symmetric axis, you walk along in some perpendicular axis. So one of the properties of EP uh, is that in this case, uh, the change in the mode splitting that you would develop uh, in all these four degenerate modes uh, that change will go as delta to the power one fourth, uh, or in other words, you'll get very high sensitivity, very high mode splitting for a very small change in the delta. And that's the interest of the optics community in these exceptional points that you will get enhanced sensitivity, basically. Yeah. And so these are experimentally measured eigenvalues as a function of delta, showing a delta to the power one fourth, basically indicative again of an EP of order four. So these sort of set of data basically tell us that yes, indeed we have mimicked this Hamiltonian fairly well in an experiment. Uh, it shows the properties that we expect it to see. Basically. Yeah. All right, so now we have to sort of go ahead and do the measurements. So what are we measuring? We start with a state uh, and uh, calculate uh, these. So I have a four dimensional system, which means that I will have four invariants here, eta one, eta two, eta three, and eta four basically. Uh, 
uh, which would be the, the, the parity operator, the parity times the Hamiltonian, parity times Hamiltonian squared, and parity times Hamiltonian cubed. Those are the four operators that I have. Okay. Now, I should also point out that measuring the expectation value of eta as a function of time means that you need to measure the entire state or you need to do quantum state tomography. In the PT symmetric experiments that have been done until today, almost all the experiments, whether in the classical or quantum domain, uh, were restricted to measuring intensities. You know, particularly in the classical domain, you only measured intensities in the waveguides, for example, or ring resonators and so on. You never measured the actual state or the phase information. On the other hand, because these uh, operators, which are conserved quantities, are non-local, that means that their measurement requires you to also measure uh, the phases, or in other words, in this case, we need to do the tomography of the four by four density matrix, or measure this four dimensional state completely, uh, to be able to evaluate these PT symmetric, uh, evaluate these constants of motion in the PT symmetric system. Okay. All right, so uh, these are the experimental results. Uh, and just how much time do I have? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, so uh, we have this, uh, the, the, so we carried out the measurement of this, you know, uh, expectation values of eta uh, at the Hermitian point gamma equals zero in the PT symmetric phase at the exceptional point of order four and in the PT broken phase, okay? And what I want to draw your attention to is that, for example, here is eta one measured as a function of time for some state we call psi two. This was actually done for four different states. Uh, so that we are looking at sort of, you know, uh, time evolution as well as evolution across states regarding what this conserved quantities look like. So eta one, okay, it remains constant as a function of time basically for a given state. Uh, this is eta two, uh, which also remains constant as a function of time basically. Uh, these are eta three values, uh, but they are measured basically for state psi two. And what you find is that uh, they are constant as a function of time, but they do depend on gamma because eta two is not the parity operator. Eta two contains Hamiltonian as well, basically. So you would imagine that its expectation value would change as gamma changes. And so you find that uh, depending on whether you are in the Hermitian limit, PT symmetric phase, exceptional point, or PT broken phase, uh, these quantities remain constant, but they do vary when gamma changes. And in particular, they sort of, you know, go from being positive uh, to being negative. So in other words, these quantities are not metrics. They are basically uh, conserved quantities, but they can be positive or negative, basically. Okay. Uh, now, this is what is shown here in the panel E uh, is showing eta 3 as a function of time uh, at the exceptional point, okay? So at the exceptional point, uh, you find that eta three is constant for each of the states, although it does depend on the state. So this is for four different states that we measured basically. And what I want to draw your attention to is that this range of time is a factor of 100. This is simulation, but basically the data has been taken over a range of time, which is a factor of 100 basically. You are going from 0.04 time measured in the units of J, basically, this is all working with J equals one, uh, two, four. And over that range, this uh, quantity remains constant. I should remind you that over this range, the norm of the state is growing as T to the power six. So the norm of the state is really diverging very rapidly. Okay. And yet eta three is constant as a function of time. And this is the same result in the PT broken phase Again, over a range, which is a factor of 10 large, basically, the times which are a factor of 10, going from you know, 0.4 all the way to four or five. And we find that over this range, again, the norm of the state, sorry, the, 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 this invariant is constant as a function of time, as you would expect it to be. But I should remind you that at least in this model, uh, the norm of the state here is exponentially growing, basically. So now you have this interesting phenomenon where eta expectation value or psi eta psi is constant where a psi psi is diverging. It's diverging either algebraically here or exponentially here. And that must have consequences. So this is sort of coming to the last part of my uh, talk, if you wish, which is what are the consequences of these uh, 
conserved quantities. Uh, so let me tell you about first consequence, which actually we noticed in, in some numerical studies that we did a uh, while ago in, you know, a couple of years ago in this PRA. And at that time, this was just numerically found, but we did not understand the deep reason behind it. Uh, now we understand, I think, the deep reason behind it. Uh, so the, at the EP or in the PT broken region, we know that psi psi goes to infinity, but psi eta psi remains constant. And there are D of these relations like this. Yeah. Now, if I write psi in terms of the amplitude and the phase as a function of time, basically, uh, then the only way this quantity is constant while this is diverging is that these phases must somehow lock because the R's are growing exponentially or algebraically with time. And the only way this entire sum is constant if the cosine and the sine thetas that you get are getting killed off fast enough such that they compensate for the growth in the R. Okay. And so because of that, what it turns out that if you look at consecutive phase differences, which I call theta k, which is sort of the difference between the phase on site k and phase on site k minus one, uh, then this difference actually becomes locked at pi by two or three pi by two, depending on the scenario. So this is what we experimentally measured. Uh, these are all the results at the EP. There are similar results at you know, uh, gamma equals uh, in the PT broken region. Uh, for all these four different states, which had no phase relation at time t equals zero of between the different sites, as time goes on, you find that theta k, no matter where they start here, you know, these are three different variations, no matter where they start here, uh, they actually always go to the same value pi by two. Uh, this is pi by two here because we have a spatially extended gain and loss profile, which is linearly varying. It turns out if you just have one gain and one loss, then these phases will lock to pi by two or minus pi by two, depending on where the gain is present in this system, basically. Uh, so this is one sort of interesting observation. And I should point out, this is an observation which is valid also in the quantum systems, which uh, have only losses. Because we are not really talking about this diverging and this being constant. We're talking about whether this decays at some rate and whether this decays exponentially slowly, which is what happens in the passive PT symmetric system or in the quantum domain, where the norm continues to decay in a certain way. But once you are in the PT broken region, uh, then what you have is basically the, sorry, uh, this continues to decay in a certain way, but in the PT broken region, this starts to decay slowly because now you have an emergence of slowly decaying eigenmode. So it's the exponential separation between how this varies versus this varies is what is at the underlying of sort of these consequences. And therefore they are valid also equally well in purely quantum systems. You know, I could make a single qubit and do this. And even in that single qubit, uh, this would still work basically. Uh, indeed, what we have here is done in the case of a single photon uh, mimicked in a circuit, basically, which was lossy again. Yeah. All right, so this is a last consequence, which I think is very interesting, and we don't have a full understanding of it yet, basically. And this is a consequence regarding what happens to eigenstates of uh, the observables which are conserved. Okay. Uh, now, in the case of uh, Hamiltonian or the Hermitian formulation, uh, we know that conserved eigen observables have eigenstates and their mixture cannot be created, basically. Yeah. No. So if I, have, uh, if I have, and that is because the commutation relation is the same as conservation law in the case of Hermitian quantum mechanics. So if I have a system uh, where momentum is conserved, and if I start the state in a pure momentum state, then over time, I will not be able to generate coherent superposition of different moment, basically. So coherence generation between states which have conserved observables, basically, or conserved quantities, eigenstates of conserved quantity is not a possibility in the case of Hermitian dynamics, but it is a possibility here. And that is because conservation is not related to commutation, basically. Uh, so what is shown here is the time-dependent angle uh, between a particular state and, basically, uh, the remaining other states of a conserved observable. So if I just focus on panel E, I am looking at V1, V2, V3, and V4, which are eigenstates of the parity operator. It is a conserved operator, eta one, basically, okay? Uh, I start the system in the eigens, and this is measuring the time-dependent angle uh, as a function of time between V1 and V2, V3, and V4. Uh, 
Okay? Basically, these are the four eigenstates. What happens, essentially? Okay? Uh, so uh, what you find, essentially, is that <laughs> uh, initially, uh, so when you start out with, uh, how should I do this? All right. So V1, V2, V3, V4 are all the eigenstates of the parity operator. Parity operator is Hermitian. Therefore, they are orthogonal to each other. Therefore, the angles are 0, pi by 2, pi by 2, pi by 2. Okay? Uh, if I am in the Hermitian limit, that is this black line, as a function of time, these angles do not change. That's what is well known, that you cannot create superposition of conserved eigenstates. However, once I start in the PT symmetric region, that's this red curve, I see uh, that certain weight, of course, develops uh, for all the other eigenstates. So I can start with a state of parity eigenstate, and then over time, it sort of becomes a state which has different parity sections in it, basically. Okay? Uh, and this you can do for different states, basically. But the general idea here is just that because conservation is not equivalent to uh, commutation, basically, because of this reason, uh, you have non-trivial consequences, which is coherence generation between eigenstates of conserved observables, something that is not possible in the Hermitian quantum dynamics. Basically. Okay. Uh, so this is a second consequence, and we are sort of trying to understand, now that we have an idea regarding the sort of conserved quantities and some of its consequences, I think that's where we are uh, moving towards. Uh, so let me come to the end of my talk. Uh, uh, I think the... Uh, so the, the, the conclusions are really that uh, we have characterized uh, constants of motion in any finite dimensional PT symmetric system. Uh, in particular, we have shown and measured those in a, in a fourth order EP, which is of interest to uh, certain communities uh, where the enhanced sensitivity associated with the order of the EP is, uh, uh, is of interest, basically. Uh, these are studies with gain loss systems, or they could be studies with uh, mode loss systems. But the key part here is that we need to measure fields and not intensities uh, to get a handle on these uh, conserved quantities, because these conserved quantities are not integrals of some local variable. Uh, they are sort of integrals or summed over uh, fields which are at uh, two different places, at, at mirror symmetric places in particular. Uh, and so this brings up the question of uh, now that I have non-Hermitian Hamiltonians and I have some idea about how to find conserved quantities in it, uh, can I think about questions regarding developing approximate methods for non-Hermitian Hamiltonians in many body cases? Conserved quantities were instrumental to developing those approximate methods when it came to Hermitian many body cases. You know, uh, that's how you develop a certain, that's how you decide to sum a certain set of diagrams. Or uh, that's how you decide to sort of, you know, make sure that even when you have used approximate method, uh, conservation laws are still satisfied, at least in the uh, low frequency, low momentum limit, which is another word for void identity, for example. Okay. And so uh, there are questions regarding non-Hermitian many body systems, which I do not understand, but I don't think a lot of people understand either. And so conservation laws are one step, or at least a part in uh, trying to understand it. So with that, I'll stop. And I do want to thank organizers of all the past uh, uh, PHHQP conferences, real or virtual, because I think uh, coming from a background in condensed matter, uh, the last sort of seven or eight years have been the most fun of, of, of uh, research area for me uh, in getting into this completely new field and working there with high school kids, undergraduate kids, and graduate students, and a whole lot of colleagues. So with that, I will uh, stop and take any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Jogesh. Um, so there are any questions? Please go ahead. If I may have a comment. Yes, Miroslav, <coughs> go ahead. No, there is an interesting connection with, with uh, <coughs> classical physics, because in classical physics, there is also analysis of conservation laws which was developed up to a very subtle level by people like Pavel Winternitz, who made a classification. In this case, there is a lot of, a lot of results available. But I didn't see anything transferred to, to this field from PD symmetrical classical systems. So if Jogesh has any comment on that. Thanks. Uh, short answer is I don't really have any deep comment because I think that in the classical systems, uh, 
the conservation laws uh, that this kind of analysis employs, uh, their measurement or observation or utilization is difficult because you need to measure fields instead of intensities. I mean, I have the, the, the sort of experimentalists that I have talked to, almost always the problem, which are these classical realization of PT systems in wave systems, uh, usually are always measuring the, not the phases, and the measurement of the phases is difficult, is what I'm told. Uh, coming to your second point, uh, I, I, I want to actually get some references from you later, but basically I think that this idea of conservation laws in open systems is really interesting, and I do not know much about it, but I think there are probably questions, interesting questions regarding what would be its consequences, basically. And when we put them to uh, sort of, you know, quantum systems or even classical systems, basically, uh, maybe it is something that needs re-examination in the light of sort of, you know, what experiments can be done today. Um, another question? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you can have this four-dimensional system and you generate four eaters, starting with parity. So, but what, you know, where does C come in there? The CPT, C, you know, because that, that's very hard to calculate, normally speaking, but it must be some combination of your eaters, I think. Uh, that is absolutely right. Uh, so, uh, these four eaters, and uh, that is absolutely right, although we do not have a rigorous proof of it, basically. Uh, we tried quite a bit with Fantaset to try, sort of figure this out, but uh, indeed, uh, because eaters are not unique, since there's a linear relation, uh, mm -hmm. there would be uh, a uh, linear combinations of eaters are also conserved quantities, and CPT product, at least in the two dimension, three dimension, and four dimension, we checked that CPT in a product uh, is basically, I mean, you can create a positive definite Mm. one which is positive definite in the PT symmetric region uh, mm. through a linear combination of this. Mm. In the two-dimensional case and three-dimensional case, we can explicitly check it because we go back to your papers, for example, and see in this two-by-two two model what is CPT and how it comes out of, you know, eta H, basically. Mm. It's really, I think, eta H divided by J, which is what the CPT in a product turns out to be, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But mm. a general procedure or a general proof that one of them must be positive definite is not known to me. I am not even sure whether there is a proof that there should be only one, because as I understand, there are multiple uh, possibilities of inner products, or multiple positive definite etas can be cooked up, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, how do you measure the, you, the, in your experiment, you needed to measure the phases of this, uh, this, this signal. I don't know, how, how did you manage that? Well, so basically what you're doing here is a photon, which, uh, uh, so this experiment is done with uh, single photons, which are put into this linear optical network, which has losses in some cases. And so what you do is you measure the photon, which is coming out at these ports, four ports, you know, where does the detector go off? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so that gives you the diagonal elements of the four by four density matrix. And then if you want to measure the off diagonal elements of the four by four density matrix, which is what the phases are, uh, mm. Then essentially you put a polarizer or something like that in front of it so that it converts the vertical state into a 45 degree state, mm -hmm. which in turn gives you what is the uh, sort of, you know, the phase between the vertical and the horizontal. You need to do it in front of each of them, basically. So the measurement part is actually a uh, fair bit of work. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> what else? I'd like to make uh, two comments. Uh, one, Jagesh, the, I don't know if you, since you mentioned condensed matter, um, there have been some studies by Marston and his collaborators on the spin quantum Hall effect, which exhibits an exceptional point, and it might be of use to you. That's just a, a comment. The other comment is, as far as particle physics is concerned, I, I've been arguing now that the broken PT phase is the correct description of particle decays. And the transitions are always between the one wave function that's growing in time and the other wave function that's decaying in time. So that gives you a time independent overlap. And any decay, any state which is decaying as, it, as its number of states declines, the state that it's decaying into, the number of states grows. Mm. 
So, so I think that's the correct description of decay and not the one that we fake the way we do it in particle physics. You just invent a non-hermitian piece, which you claim, oh, but only the decaying piece is going to contribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so if I, I mean, if I understand you correctly, I guess are you basically rephrasing that the arrow of time being broken can be thought about as we being in the PT broken phase. Is that a fair state, restatement of what you said? Uh, no, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying that because I regard the, the arrow of time as a statistical inference. It's simply, if I, if, I drop a, if I drop a cup on the ground and it breaks up into little pieces, I have to wait an awful long time before the previous, uh, the, the previous point in okay, I understand. Is, right. is revisited. So, okay, okay. Uh, but, so I don't think it's anything, I don't think it's an arrow of time issue. Okay. Um, but you're saying in decays, you, you, you should take into account the two states, the decaying state and what it's decaying into as, yes. a, as a whole system. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, that, and that's the piece that's just left out. Yeah. In, 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 all, in all quantum mechanics discussions of, of, of decays, even in quantum field theory, you don't look at the, the decay product. But the decay product is just as much controlled by the quantum mechanics as the object that's decaying. Yeah. Okay. Philip, in Hermitian quantum mechanics, you always consider two kinds of wave functions. One is the decaying wave function and one is the complex conjugate wave function. But in general, as you say, there's also the exponentially exploding wave function and the complex conjugate of the exploding wave function. So yes. in a sense, you look at four wave functions where you can construct quantities which may in future stay constant. And um, you have on one hand the complex or Hermitian conjugation uh, of the series, and you have the time inversion in a sense that you exchange initial and final uh, conditions. So um, you have another variety to, uh, to invert your series in time. So um, I think if you have an open system, you have a much richer structure to work on. My my constraint on everything is that it should be Lorentz covariant. And then you are forced uh, to combine pairs of these four wave functions in a way uh, that uh, uh, you, you look at the exponential decaying and the exponential growing. And on the other side, the complex conjugate of the exponential decaying and the complex conjugate of the exponential growing wave function. This you can only achieve if you, uh, if, uh, this you have to uh, combine to uh, achieve Lorentz covariance. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you. I think Lorentz covariance is absolutely the driver. And um, my, my talk a few weeks ago was on the fact that PT is a member of the complex Lorentz group. And I think that's, uh, that was one of the first things I learned from Carl, and I've always regarded that as the, <laughs> the most significant aspect of PT. Um, but to go back to decays, the way we, the way we cheat in, is we look at a many-channel a many coupled system where, where particles are going from channel one to channel two. Mm -hmm. And we try to describe channel one as an effective one-body problem. Mm -hmm. And then we have to use a complex potential. But that does not mean that we have complex potentials. And you have to include all of the decay products in, in order, in, first of all, you can't leave them out if you want to be unitary. But you shouldn't think that because you, you're using a complex one-body problem that you've given up unitarity. What you've done is you've ignored the decay products. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I make a comment about that? At the classical level, um, Jonesy and I wrote a paper a long time ago about the fact that if you have a um, oscillator with a dissipative term in it, okay, uh, it looks like the energy is not conserved, okay, but that's because you're measuring the wrong thing. In fact, uh, in an oscillator, say with with uh, with decay, with loss, um, uh, that is as we showed. That is, in fact, um, a Hamiltonian system. And the energy is, in fact, conserved 
but the energy is not what you think it is. In fact, the amplitude for the, uh, for the decay is going down exponentially. And there's another term that in fact is going up exponentially, which yeah. I won't go into. And the product of the two is actually constant in time. Okay. So this is, uh, this is reminiscent of what you talked about in your, in your talk, Yogesh, um, where you have something where, where you have an amplitude that is going off to infinity or going to zero, but you still have a conserved quantity. And that is the mechanism for why a dissipative system like a like an oscillator with damping is actual actually has a conserved energy. It's just that the energy isn't what you think it is. Um, in the case of a quantum system, um, when if you start in the PT unbroken phase, uh, you have to use the CPT in a product, but in the unbroken phase, you can show that um, you have uh, a conservation, okay? The minute you go toward the breaking point, you have the states becoming self-orthogonal. And in fact, what you need, and this is a reference to what Philip just said, what you need to do is to define, you don't take the dot product of the state with itself, but rather you take the state when you when you cross over into the PT broken region, you take the state, you take one state and dot it into the other state, and that is the, where you get a, a conservation. Okay, it's exactly the same thing that happens at the classical level with a with a um, an oscillator with loss. Okay, so I agree with Philip very strongly. Um, I think that in order to study what is going on in order to see unitarity and the broken phase, you have to not dot a state with itself. The state doesn't, the state by itself is just self orthogonal. You don't get anything from that. You have to dot one state into the other state. And that's where you see um, the, the unitarity principle coming out. Okay. I think a lot more work has to be done on this, of course. So are, you, are you talking about the, the Jordan associated function? If you're right at the, the breaking point, you, the, two, the two, let's say in a two in a two state system, the two states coincide. You get the, it goes to be degenerate, but then you have the Jordan associated function. That's right. I don't know what happens after when it when it's fully broken. Now, um, if I, if I can just add a couple of things. Um, the operator that Jogesh introduced, which he called eta, the intertwining operator, it takes, in the broken phase, it takes non-time dependent matrix elements between the two, the, the state that's decaying and the state that's growing. And that's, the, that's why you use, that's why you have to use the intertwining operator to construct unitarity. But I also wanted to comment uh, on the, the whole idea of decay. We've always associated decay with dissipation and damping, but uh, as, as I mentioned in the talk I gave a few weeks ago, um, in the Heiss-Uhlenbeck oscillator, you can have complex conjugate eigenfunction, eigenvalues, in a Hamiltonian with no dissipative term at all. And that's because it's a fourth order theory. And so if uh, I think that we can actually make a break between dissipation and decay. I'm not saying that there isn't dissipation in the real world, but I'm saying is that decay itself doesn't have to be correlated with dissipation. A comment to um, what I said to Carl uh, some weeks ago, we had the presentation on the Bateman oscillator and I, I, I thought that you can cook it down to the Nakanishi oscillator, but I figured out in the Bateman oscillator, you somehow go from an oscillator with uh, real fields and then you renormalize the fields by time dependent uh, normalizations and they bring imaginary parts to the wave functions and, uh, uh, or decaying uh, uh, wave functions and exponentially exploding wave functions. And so in the end, the Bateman oscillator combines somehow the uh, decaying wave function of the oscillator with the complex conjugate uh, of the exploding uh, wave function. 
while in the Nakanishi model you combine somehow the exponential uh, decaying wave functions with the uh, same wave functions where the uh, uh, time is inverted, the time gets negative, so you get an exponential exploding wave function, but you have no uh, complex conjugation. So uh, these two oscillators, they are by nature different, uh, while the uh, Bateman oscillator takes only half of the Nakanishi model where he, it concentrates on the exponential decaying wave function and the complex conjugate of the exploding wave function. Thanks. There are any more questions to Yogesh? If not, then thank you very much, Yogesh. Uh, thank you for uh, organizing this great seminar series. You know, I look forward to mm -hmm. future ones as well. And see you next week. We, next week we have a next week we have a seminar of Andres Milga. So thank you very much again, you get, and thank you to everyone thank you. for participate. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Everyone, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Well done. Thank you.